All right. So on to pediatrics, how do pediatrics grow? Well, they're going to have lots of different characteristics depending on their age groups. So general breakup is newborns are the first couple hours of life. Neonates are first 28 days and they become infants until they're one year old. Then they're toddlers until they're three. Then they become preschoolers, school age, finally adolescents before they become adults. So like, I, like we were saying, they, in the first few hours of life, first few weeks of their life, they're mostly just going to sleep because their brain is taking up a majority of their energy and their caloric needs. Pulses are going to be a lot higher, 120 to 160. Respiration is very high, although it's going to drop to about 30 to 40 a few minutes after birth. Neonates, again, same thing, mostly sleeping, interspersed with feeding. As we grow from two to 12 months, this is when a lot of the very complex changes happen. We start to um, recognize faces. We start to understand object permanence. We, and by the one-year mark, we should be walking. Common illnesses in this group are a lot of respiratory problems, GI, CNS with nausea, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, seizures, and SIDS. Up until about eight months, the chance for sudden infant death syndrome is unfortunately very high. I've had SIDS cases before. We don't really know what causes SIDS. We do not. There's a couple things that increase the risk for it, like increased maternal age, smoking during gestation, um, and other problems. But realistically, we cannot differentiate exactly what causes this. Remember, as far as what we expect, their pulse is to be about 80 to 140. Respiration is still in 30 to 40. And BP is 82 over 44. Now, the minimum for blood pressure is going to be 70 plus two times their age. That's the minimum. It's not the average. When they become toddlers, this is the one to three age range. This is when muscle mass and bone density start to increase. So we start adding weight pretty quickly. Everything's developing. We're gonna have better motor control, better control over all functions of our body. They'll start to have likes and dislikes and language skills. <clears throat> toddlers from one to three, they're gonna suffer from asthma, bronchiolitis, foreign body airway obstructions, croup, vomiting and diarrhea, febrile seizures, sepsis, and meningitis. As far as their pulses, and we're getting a little more in the average range here, 80 to 120. Respiration is still high, 25 to 30, and BP is a little bit higher than we saw in infants. The preschool age, <coughs> excuse me, preschool age range improved fine motor skills. This is also when we start to have influences from outside of our family. So we start to meet people, and friends, um, classmates. This will also help them when they start learning problem solving skills and developing um, an assessment of right and wrong. Same problems um, for these guys as well. They are more prone, more prone to falls. And because of their bigger than average heads or say proportionally larger heads, when they do fall, they're gonna to fall top heavy and they're more likely to strike their heads. Pulses more normalized, respiration is more normalized, BP more normalized. They're gonna grow a lot faster at this range. Their head will become proportional at about six to seven years of age. So until then, expect them to suffer more head injuries as it's just larger. In the six to 12 range, this is also when they're gonna start experimenting with things, meeting people, developing their internal preferences for things. Illnesses are, and injuries are prevalent because of increased activity, sports, at school, fractures, sprains, strains, falls, more normalized blood pressure and pulse as well. In the adolescent age range, most people are considered adults, honestly, by this point. This is the final growth in maturing and development. However, it's not necessarily the final phase in brain development. That finishes developing by about your mid-20s. Females' height and weight gain is less dramatic and usually complete by 18. Males can continue growing into their 20s. Males gain an average of eight inches before the age of 21 but females stop growing by about 18. Some males continue to grow. I continued to grow until I was in my mid twenties. This is also when they're gonna to start to experiment with sex, drugs, and alcohol. Pulses, everything's more normalized. Now we're also gonna to start to see the same things that affect adults. So anatomical differences in infants, pediatrics, their head is about 25% of their total body weight. Like I was saying, this means that they're more prone to falls, more prone to falling, striking their head. The fontanelles are what we would call 
the breaks in their skull. Remember when the skull is originally coming out of the, um, the vaginal canal, the vaginal canal, it's kind of folded over itself to facilitate delivery. The skull is going to take a few months to harden up. During this time, we have exposed meningeal layers. If you touch in the fontanelles, you're not touching the brain, right? Because there's the layer of skin and then there's the three layers of the meninges blocking it. Remember, there's the hard mother, the dura matter, the arachnoid space, and then the pia matter, the soft matter, the soft mother, sorry. The fontanelles are going to remain unfused for nine up to 18 months. All right, their larynx is slightly higher, their jaw is small, the tongue is large and floppy, and their nose breathers until approximately six months. In order to maintain a better sniffing position, the more neutral inline position of their head and neck, we might need to put some padding underneath their shoulders rather than hyper strike rather than hyperextending their neck. Their epiglottis is going to be a slightly different shape. Remember in adults, we consider it a leaf shape. In, um, in pediatrics, it's gonna be omega shaped, which is the Greek letter omega. Place padding under the shoulders of children under three. Other than that, generally the same considerations. They are and more likely to reach acidosis because their bodies aren't as efficient at storing myoglobin, their muscles are not as developed, including the muscles involved in respiration. Anytime you see accessory muscle use on pediatrics trying to breathe, they're in respiratory distress and it's a serious consideration. Hang on one second, guys, I need to get a fan. All right, back to it. So then we're just talking about chest and pulmonary function. <clears throat> Their lungs are fragile. Rib fractures are less common, but that's because everything's a little more, um, has more give to it. In fact, we call fractures in children green stick fractures, referring to uh, like a branch. You know, if a branch is fresh off a tree, you'll have harder bending and snapping it as opposed to a dead tree, tree branch, which is dried out and you can snap it. So that's why we call them green stick fractures. They're harder to break. So if you see broken ribs in a kid, you need to be suspicious of child abuse. <clears throat> Metabolic needs for breathing are almost double that of an adult because of all the accessory muscle use that they need just to help breathe. Their diaphragm is just not smart or not strong enough. Cardiac output in infants and children depends on their heart rate, not by increasing stroke volume. They're able to vasoconstrict peripheral circulation to increase and maintain blood pressure longer than adults. You guys might be aware of that kids tend to stay in compensated shock longer than adults do. This is true. However, if you were to inflict the same amount of damage to an adult and a pediatric patient, who would go into uncompensated shock first? The kids, just because they have less resources in order to fight those things. Their sympathetic nervous systems are not as strong and they're not going to be able to fight off those problems for as long they are going to compensate longer. So they're gonna seem fine, seem fine, seem fine, and crash hard. All their responses are going to be limited. Big one is their ability to thermoregulate. So that big consideration, um, remember yesterday we were talking about the MARCH protocols for trauma consideration, the H in that stands for um, hypothermia, definitely going to be more of a concern in pediatric patients. <clears throat> they're also not going to have the same glycogen stores that adults do. Now, little babies do. Little babies have huge fat deposits on their body, and that's because their brain is taking up a lot of energy. They need to store reserves so they can burn that while they're sleeping. Also, newborns are not going to be able to shiver, not going to be able to maintain their body heat through that. The abdominal muscles are not very well developed, and therefore, very little protection to the internal organs. The big portion here is 
The liver and the spleen are large and very fragile. And the, especially the liver, it's not protected by the rib cage like it is an adult. So you guys might know that we do the Heimlich for adults, right? If they're having trouble breathing, you can get behind them, put your hand right underneath their diaphragm and then pull in and up in order to try to uh, and initiate a diaphragmatic response, kind of like vomiting in order to get them to expel whatever's stuck in their airway. Can you do the, 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 um, the Heimlich on pediatrics? No, not until they're about 10 or 12 years old. And even then it's generally contraindicated. What do we do instead for infants? If they're choking on something, we do chest thrusts, very similar to CPR. And then we'll do back blows, flipping them over and doing that. <clears throat> Their skin is thinner, less fat for protection and insulation, larger body surface area to body mass. So think about it. The amount of skin that's exposed to the external environment is greater in comparison to the amount of mass that they have behind it, as opposed to you and me, where we have a lot more skin than a baby, but we also have a lot more weight than a baby. So we're able to better store our heat. And we also have more fat deposits in our skin, especially women, right? Not that women are fatter, but just that women have more fat tissue in their body than men do on average. So there's a big thing we like to talk about when we're doing pediatric assessments, which is the pediatric assessment triangle. Now, I like to think of this as just a good assessment triangle for all your patients, not just for pediatrics. The three components are appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. These are all things you can look at from across the room or from nearby the kid. You don't necessarily have to be touching them or talking to them or interacting with them in any meaningful way in order to get these three things, right? You can look at how they're breathing, look at what they look like, their skin specifically, and then their circulation, their pulse. You can take brachial pulses rather than radial pulses. If you were at all suspicious of child abuse, it needs to be responded. How are they acting around the family? Are they fearful? Remember that we are mandatory reporters. So if you see something, you need to report it. It's your duty. It's your job. If the parent is freaking out, the kid will pick up on it. Maybe you guys have seen like parents, they're watching their little kids. The little kid has just learned to walk. The kid's walking. The kid falls. If the parent jumps up and goes like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and runs over to the kid, the kid's going to pick up on that and start freaking out with them. If the parent maintains cool or even laughs or is like, oh no, get up, get up, let's go. You can distract kids from injuries because they're learning how to respond and they're mimicking things that they're seeing in the environment. So if they're around people with very high stress and anxiety, the kids are gonna be higher stress and anxiety. You see this time and time and time and time and time again. It would make sense if you, get, if you had to get a license to have a kid the same way you need a license to drive a car, right? I think that raising a kid takes a lot more responsibility than driving a car. And uh, yet there's no license associated with it. There probably should be. You should have to pass, I think, at least an IQ test before you get a, a license to have kids. But again, I'm not in charge of these decisions. And honestly, I would never make that decision because we're basically stepping into eugenics territory at that point. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of acting like Hitler. I mean, more or less. <clears throat> I just have to mention Hitler every once in a while to make sure you guys are still paying attention. All right, then we need to determine the urgency of the patient in order to get cared for. APU scale, this means they're alert. They're only responsive to voice. They're responsive to painful stimuli or they're completely unresponsive. That's what AVPU responds to. You can see that right here. By painful stimuli, we tend to do trapezius pinches, Sternal rubs. I don't like to do sternal rubs on kids because, you know, that seems kind of rough. I'll just, usually what I'll do is I'll take their, um, their fingers and I'll just kind of squeeze the tips of their fingers or I'll do a little trapezius pinches. On adults, you better believe I'm rubbing the hell out of that sternum. By the way, just a little note for you guys, when you're doing a sternal rub, do it for at least 15 seconds. Not necessarily on pediatric patients, but on your adult patients. Do you know how many times I've taken a patient who's definitely conscious, just laying there ignoring people into the hospital and the doctor's like, he's like, tries to do a sternal rub and he'll rub very gently on their sternum for like two seconds and they don't respond. And he goes, oh, they're unresponsive. And I always say, let me give that a shot. And I'll get there and you dig your knuckles in for 10 seconds and then they'll come too. okay? Give them good sternal rubs, all right? It takes a second to wake people up. You're not doing any permanent damage to them, okay? Don't worry, it might seem mean, but there's no permanent damage. The worst case scenario, they're gonna have a bruise. So 
We like to use the Glasgow Coma Scale for pediatrics. I don't think it works very well for pediatrics. <clears throat> now, I do want to say a quick note about um, Glasgow Coma Scale, something that might help you guys remember this more easily. How many points are associated with each one? Four for eye opening, five for verbal response, and six for motor response. How can you remember that? Here's how I do it. I think of, hey, four eyes, because eyes are for, with four points. For a verbal five, I think of the, the band Jackson Five. Maybe you guys remember them from back in the day. Michael Jackson was in the Jackson Five. His sister Janet Jackson was not in the Jackson Five. Okay, they were all the male Jacksons. Michael Jackson first got his fame in the Jackson Five. It was the singing group. So I think of verbal response and I think of Jackson Five. So worth five points, the verbal response. Finally, for the six points in motor response, I think of a V6 engine. So there you go. Now, one more note on Glasgow Coma Scale. You guys will see that at the bottom of motor response, we have decorticate flexion and decerebrate extension. So this means we're either flexing the muscles in or we're extending them out. Maybe you guys have watched MMA fights or street fights or you've, you've fought yourself and you've seen this happen. What does it mean decorticate and decerebrate? Well, first of all, decorticate is better than decerebrate. Why is that? Decorticate, we're pulling into our core. Think about someone kind of laying on the ground in the fetal position. Your arms, your legs, your head are all kind of bent in to protect the core of your body, decorticate. Decerebrate means we have this extension of our limbs. Maybe you guys have seen boxers when someone gets knocked out and I'm talking about like punched and they just go down instantly, completely unconscious. Maybe you've seen them with their arms. They go down, their arms will be sticking out at these strange angles. That's called the cerebrate positioning. Now, where do we get these names? It has to do with the brain herniation out of the foramen magnum. Remember that the medulla is sitting right there in the foramen magnum. The medulla controls respiration, heart rate, vaso vasoconstriction, gag response, uh, vomiting, all of those autonomic nervous system responses. If that starts herniating out of the foramen magnum, the core or the brain core, the brain stem is being pressed decorticate positioning. We can still generally defend ourselves. I mean, not in any uh, conscious way, but our body still pulls in to try to protect its vital organs. Decerebrate, now we're talking about the cerebrum. That is the functional unit of the brain, what we would think of when we think of the brain. Now this is herniating outside of the of this frame and magnum. It doesn't necessarily mean that the cerebrum is in the frame and magnum herniating out. It just means that the cerebrum is now fully involved. When this happens to you, <clears throat> your body is telling you to sit down, take a breather, think about what's going on. Let's reevaluate this whole situation. <clears throat> All right. So the best places to take pulses are apical pulses. Warm your stethoscope up, put it right there on their chest. Listen to their pulse that way. Or for palpating a pulse, the best place is in the brachial artery. Feel on the inside of their bicep, the medial aspect of the bicep, underneath the curve of that muscle. Now, obviously, infants aren't going to really have much of a muscle there, but you can feel it on yourself. And once you find your brachial pulse on yourself, you'll be able to find it on infants. I'll give you guys a hint. It's not very hard. Literally, just press basically anywhere on the inside of your arm, and you'll probably feel it. Again, we're also checking their skin's color, skin turgor. Is it sunken or flat fontanelles? Keep in mind, if someone's dehydrated, their fontanelles will be sunken. If they're overhydrated, their fontanelles might even be bulging. This is a case of um, too much water in the brain. Now, obviously, because infants' fontanelles are not closed up, they're going to deal with these head traumas and traumatic brain injuries and the swelling that accompanies them slightly better than an adult patient would. Not very much better, not as much as you might expect, but they will deal with it slightly better just because there's slightly more room for expansion. This doesn't mean that head injuries aren't, not, aren't a concern for pediatrics, so obviously. <clears throat> All right, sometimes it's helpful to have what's called a transition phase where you're getting used, you're letting the kid get used to you so they become more comfortable so that they're not gonna freak out when you start transporting them. However, if you've got an acute kid, you skip this stage and you just take them with you, you bring mom or someone in the back, if they're very acute, I like don't want to have mom or dad in the back. Okay, I don't. I need to have complete focus and having an untrained medical professional in the back who's going to add chaos to the scene is not going to help me out. 
Okay. Not that I don't want mom or dad involved. It's just that I know that kid's going to get the best care if mom or dad's not there. Also with your older patients, teenagers, especially, it might be helpful to separate patient from parent. Just not, I'm not saying permanently. I'm saying temporarily have the captain take mom in the other room, mom, dad, in the other room, talk to them a little bit so that you can get down on the level of the kid and ask them like, Hey, listen, is something going on? Are your mom and dad angry at you? Um, have they been hitting you? Is there something else going on? Have you been eating? Are you pregnant? Is there any chance you're pregnant? Okay. They need to, you need to build a rapport with them and then you need to get slight separation. I'm obviously not saying like pull the kid away from the parent into another room because that comes with its own bag of problems. But if you can, and you get a chance to talk to the kid independent of the parents and independent of someone that might be guiding their responses, that can be very helpful. I've, I've pulled kids away and it's all about the way you phrase things. We had one where on um, these kids or they were fighting, they were making too much noise or something. And the dad got pissed and they, they were staying in a hotel and uh, they were in the shower showering and they were making too much noise for him. And so he slammed the glass door of the shower shut and it shattered and got everywhere. They had very minor cuts and abrasions in their legs. Okay. Now, do you think I reported that as a possible child abuse? Absolutely. I did. Absolutely. I was suspicious of this even beforehand. Dad was trying to say that I just shut the door really hard and it just slammed. But once I got in the kids in the back, mom wanted to come with them. The kids were very young. They were like five and seven or something like that. Maybe it was six and four. I don't know. They were very young. Mom wanted to come with them. Dad was staying behind, which was for the best. I talked to the captain. We both agreed that was probably for the best. And then even though mom was there, I was able to talk to the kids and I got them to stop crying and I was chatting with them. And then I, I said to them, it's like, Hey guys, like, was dad really angry when he, when he, when that door shut, did he kind of slam it? And they were like, yeah. And I said, does dad do that sometimes? And they said, yeah. Now, realistically, was that dad being abusive towards his kids? No, it did not seem like it. They seemed like they were very healthy and happy. They didn't seem fearful of the dad. They didn't seem fearful of mom. Oh my God. Oh my God. Sorry guys, another spine just popped up. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. My God. Why is this happening to me? Oh God. Excuse me. Goodness gracious. All right, I'm thoroughly terrified to live in my own house now. Okay, so back to what I was saying. Did dad seem like he was an abusive person? No. Did it seem like dad just lost his temper? Yes. Does it seem like maybe there's some history of dad losing his temper at the kids? Yes. Should I have reported that? Absolutely. Does that mean just because you reported that dad and mom are gonna get their kids taken away from them? No. What it means is there's going to be a file reported and maybe if enough files are completed, CPS will pay them a visit just to see how things are going. It's your responsibility to do this. Just because you don't think that mom and dad are abusive parents doesn't mean that they aren't. And here's the other part of this that we really can't control. These kids that we're treating don't have any agency. They don't have any ability to make their own decisions. They cannot ask for help. All right. Some can, but not all of them. So if you see anything that's even slightly suspicious as one of the very few people privy to that slice of life, it's your job to report it. We might be the only person that sees these things. You need to be aware and you need to be careful. We do focused histories. Look at everything. Look at their past illnesses, including any birth defects they might've had. All right. Okay, um, if they're babies and we're worried about their hydration, we can look at their fontanelles. We can also ask about the number of wet diapers. Now, kids, babies, infants, we can sometimes go through five to 10 diapers per day. Okay, that's not abnormal. If you've only changed the diaper once all day long, that kid is dehydrated, okay? The same thing in an adult. When we become extremely, extremely dehydrated, we stop sweating because our body has decided that even though we're overheating, we cannot afford to lose any more water through sweating. So we will stop sweating. I'm gonna go over just a couple things that I want you to know about pediatrics and what we're looking for. The one is febrile seizures. Febrile seizures happen anytime from about 
two to five is when they're most likely. What causes a febrile seizure? It's a rapid spike in their body temperature, okay? Now, little kids, as we discussed, they're not so good at, hype, um, at thermoregulation. So what'll happen is they'll wake up in the morning and their temperature might be a little bit elevated. Now, pediatrics have slightly elevated temperatures. That's not abnormal. We'd expect kids and newborns, infants to have temps somewhere between like 98 all the way up to maybe even 99.9 .9 or 100. That's not abnormal. So let's say a kid wakes up and he's not feeling great, but he's still running around. He's still got lots of energy. He wakes up and he's like maybe 100, maybe like 100.5. He goes outside, he's playing, and he's not very good at thermoregulating. So what's going to happen? His body temperature is going to jump to 101, 102, maybe even 103. When we get a quick two degree temperature jump, that's what causes febrile seizures. It's that sudden jump in their temperature. Now, they've already experienced that jump in their temperature. So when we get on scene, they're usually gonna be postictal. Everyone's freaking out because seizures are very visually scary things. And we're gonna be generally worried about what causes seizures. Is this an epileptic thing? Probably not. Most kids that have febrile seizures don't develop epilepsy. They don't have any seizures later in their life. They end up being fine right afterwards. Generally not a cause for concern, but if it's the first febrile seizure, absolutely it should be transported to the hospital. However, if the kid's postictal and everything's looking good, you can always talk with the family about maybe them transporting the kid in on their own. Now, usually be more comfortable with you as a paramedic doing it, but realistically, the only thing you could do would be administrate some benzos to stop the seizure activity or administrate some sort of ventilatory support. So they're very unlikely to have further seizures. That's what I'm trying to get at here. We're going to get on scene. They're already 102. It's very unlikely that they're going to jump from 102 to 105, but there's a couple things you guys can do to prevent that, which is not wrap them up in a blanket. Okay. You don't really want to use ice packs because again, now we're worried about rebound hypothermia and we don't really want to drop their blood pressure quickly, but we don't want to cover them up with blankets. If they're dressed in clothes, take off their clothes. Okay. Get them down to their diaper. Get them in the nice back of the ambulance where it's cool air can flow over them. Make sure you're not rebounding their hypothermia. Take their temperature frequently and they should be fine. Nine times out of 10, that little baby's going to fall asleep with you in the back of the ambulance, not do anything else. I'm very comfortable if the kids are sleeping and I'm very comfortable if the kids are screaming because when a kid is screaming, his airway is patent and he's doing just fine. He might be in pain, but he's doing just fine. Realistically, all the things as a paramedic I'm looking for are okay. The other things are respiratory illnesses that affect us a little older in life, like croup and epiglottitis. Epiglottitis will affect us all the way up to over about seven or eight. Croup is generally earlier. The main difference is croup affects us during the winter months. The best way to treat it is with cool air. Literally just taking the kid outside for the cool air will help reduce that constriction in their bronchioles and will help them breathe better. They might need some sort of nebulized epinephrine or nebulized saline to help um, them breathe, but that's generally unnecessary. Most of these cases can be handled just by some cool air, literally just taking them outside. Epiglottitis as the name suggests, is inflammation of the epiglottis. So this happens to us every time you get a throat in, or a sore throat, right? You're having, you have epiglottitis. Your epiglottis is inflamed, it's swollen, it's, it's not doing great. It hurts to swallow, you guys know that. But as adults, we can still swallow. But kids, if it hurts, they're not gonna do it, especially younger kids. So that means with epiglottitis, we're gonna see drooling. With croup, there's not going to be drooling. There's going to be that seal-like barking cough. All right, so those are the big things I want you guys to know about for infants that you're probably going to get tested on.